Okay, we got a Bible study. We're starting a whole new book now. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of our God and Savior and of Christ Jesus, our hope. That's what they mean. What is your hope in? It's in Jesus Christ. Is your hope on the cross? Well, part of it. Is your hope in the resurrection? Part of it. Your hope is that Jesus is real. He is in heaven and you are are written in the Lamb's book of life. And you will receive eternal life. That's what your hope is in. It's very clear. Those who put their hope in the things of the world will fail. When you die, you will take nothing with you. And you will be, because you did not hope in the Lord and believe in the Lord, you will be cast into, into hell, the lake of fire for all eternity. But we who are believers, we have a hope in Jesus Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So, let's talk about mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is receiving something that you do not deserve. Like if you went to bankruptcy court, and you owed a million dollars. Now, you're guilty. You owe the million dollars. And the judge says, I'm going to forgive all of your debt. That's mercy. You're receiving something you have not earned, something you have not deserved. You know, the same with food stamps today. People think they've earned food stamps. No, food stamps are government mercy. Because the government doesn't want a bunch of starving people and starving children on the streets of America. And I agree with them. I don't think we should allow people to stand outside starving, especially children. No. But food stamps are not a right it's not something you earned. It's something you don't deserve that's given to you out of mercy. That's the way it is. So you are a sinner and you do not, and I myself too, we do not deserve our sins to be forgiven against God. But Jesus Christ showed us mercy, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. It's the mercy is through Christ. God's mercy through his son Christ is why the believers are going to spend eternity in heaven. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesia so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. You see, Paul, he would go to a place, he would preach, then people would come in afterwards trying to discredit him. They were saying, oh, we're the, we're the real teachers from Jesus Christ. And they would start preaching things like false doctrines, myths, M-Y-T-H-S, you know, things that it's just a myth. It doesn't exist. Like one of the myths could have been, they'd come in and say, the rapture's already occurred. There's not going to be a rapture. Whatever is a lie is a myth. And endless genealogies. They always, they want to boast themselves up, brag themselves up about who their ancestors were. You know, that's what a spoiled little brat child does in college. If things aren't going well in college, the spoiled little brat says, do you know who my grandfather was? 
He founded this college. So if you want to keep your job, you better give me a better grade. You see, that's what genealogies, they're not good for anything. Let's say you find out that you were related to a hundred famous people in the past. How does that help you today? And I will say this, genealogies can't get you to heaven. You know, there's people in my family line that are in hell. I don't know who they are. I've never met them, you know, two generations, three generations, four, five, six generations, ten generations back in my family line. They're in hell because they didn't believe in Jesus Christ. So what good would it be to me to know this, to know things about them? And then I was born and I believed in Jesus Christ, so I'm going to heaven. But you know there's going to be people like, let's say the, the world goes another 400 years, which it's not going to, but just for example. If you go another 400 years forward now into the future... In my family line, there's going to be a lot of people who don't believe in Jesus then either, and they're going to go to hell. So what good is it to go back into your genealogy you know, past your own parents and your your immediate, you know, grandparents? What good is it to know your great, great, great grandmother, you know, and all the hardships she had in the world? That's what Paul is saying. Endless genealogies that don't do any good for anything. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work. They're not trying to advance God's work. They're trying to promote strife stress. They're trying to promote controversial things, controversy. They're trying to stir up the pot. You know, people who do this are living for themselves. They they don't want the attention to be on Paul. They don't want the attention to be on Jesus Christ. They want the attention to be on themselves. That's what the enemy, the devil did. He doesn't want us worshiping God the Father. He wants to be the one that we are required to worship. And he's going to prove that during the tribulation. He will put a seal on your hand or forehead to buy or sell and force you. When you take the seal, you can't get the seal unless you bow down to the image of the beast. Oh. See, there's a catch that comes with it. Advancing God's work, which is by faith. You can only do God's work. God says, I can only be worshipped in two ways. Truth and in spirit. You know, that's what faith is. Faith in the truth. Receiving faith by the spirit, you know. God can only be worshipped in two ways. Truth and in spirit. And if you're not doing that, you're not doing God's work. The goal of the command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience. And a good conscience, which... Oh, and a sincere faith. So the goal is love, a pure heart, a clean, good conscience, your conscience is clean, and a sincere faith. That's how you serve God. Not by talking, gossiping, causing rumors, stress, controversy. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. We've never lived in a generation more than right now. It's just everywhere you go, especially, you know, YouTube, Facebook, um, Twitter. It's just the news media, Instagram. It's just endless. I mean, there's people on there talking about like, 
the wooden spoons they use to stir, you know, the soup. I mean, there's there's tens of thousands of videos on wooden spoons to stir your soup. Meaningless. You go back to Ecclesiastes. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Paul says here, it's just meaningless talk. It doesn't amount to anything. I'll give you an example. It would be like tilling the earth, getting the garden already, getting the rows, covering the rows up and everything, putting the stakes in your garden, everything, but you didn't plant the seeds in the garden. You keep coming back week after week and nothing's growing. You didn't put the seeds in the in the soil. That's what meaningless talk is. It's like you're doing everything except putting the seeds in the soil. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Oh, boy, I know people like that. They want to be teachers. They want to be the guy who goes around the church collecting the money in the little baskets. They want to be the pastor. They want to be, you know, there's always people telling the pastor what he said wrong last week because they want to be the pastor. They want to be anything of authority. They want that job. Doesn't matter if they're skilled or not. Doesn't matter if they have what it takes. They want the job because in their own brain... They are far more valuable in their brain than they actually are in real life as far as skills are concerned. You know, if you hire a real chef, like if you hire, a, you know, a chef or a cook, a line cook, you can hire anybody off the street. But if you're going to hire someone, a real chef for your very fancy restaurant, you know, during the interview, they give you an apron and say, go into the kitchen and prove that you can cook certain things. And they will test you out for three days and have you cook everything on the menu to see if they even like you. They're not going to give you the job until, they pr until you prove that you can cook all that stuff. They're not going to give you a $90,000 a year job. Well, Paul's saying the same thing here. It's all meaningless talk. They want to be the teachers, but they don't even, they, it says they do not even know what they're talking about. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Now, this next paragraph is going to blow your mind. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels. Okay. I want to spend a couple minutes here. We know the law is not made for the law, the people who keep the law. Because we live in a, on God's law. We do not need the law because we never break the law. We go by God's law. God says, you don't, you shall not murder, you shall not steal. Okay, well, the world says you shall not murder and you shall not steal or you're going to prison. So if you don't murder and you don't steal, you see, you're, you're on God's law. You're above the laws of the world. If you just follow God's laws, guess what? You'll never break an earthly law. You'll never do it. But now, who is the law made for? Now, that's the part of the paragraph. This is going to blow your mind. And I want you to compare what they say here to what's going on in today's society. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made for... The law was made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels... The ungodly and sinful, the unholy and non-religious, 
for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, now listen to this part, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, that's the biggest one today. Everything homosexual, transgender is being pushed on the public like it's solid gold. What does God say in the Bible right here, 1 Timothy chapter 1? He's saying it is against God to be sexually immoral and practice homosexuality. That is 100% against God. God finds this detestable. For slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which he entrusted to me, says Paul. So these people, they're not just coming in and lying. They're coming into the church and lying and stealing, and they want to be in charge. They don't know anything about it. They don't follow the rules, the regulations, the commands. They're committing sexual immorality. They're committing homosexual acts inside the church. Don't fall for what's going on today. No, don't do it. Do not fall for what's going on today. If it's against God, just stand still. You know, we all see these things. You can't even look at the news without seeing them. You can't walk out the door without seeing um, two girls holding hands and kissing now or two guys holding hands. You can't see, you can't live in this society without seeing what's going on in front of your face. And then they're trying to push it into our children. But. This is not your battle. You know, only like 2% of or 3% of the population is gay, considers themselves homosexual. 97% do not. But what does God say? It's an abomination. God says it's an abomination in the Old Testament. So my advice is to stand still, watch Jesus Christ, and ignore what they're doing in this world. Just ignore it, because God's going to take it away. God's going to say real soon, he's going to put, he's going to set that on fire and destroy it. You better believe it. And it only upsets people because, you know, they try to fight against the craziness. You know, I had a guy tell me once, who's dumber? Who is dumber? Who is the most stupid person in this example? The idiot who doesn't know what he's talking about or the person who argues with the idiot who doesn't know what he's talking about? Well, if, if you walk up to a fool and start arguing with a fool then you become foolish, and now we have two fools in this situation. But a wise man recognizes these things are outside of God. You're not going to participate in them. You're going to go somewhere and study the Bible at this nice river, maybe come to this river or wherever you live, throw a fishing pole in the water with the bobber, and start reading your Bible. And then if you get a fish, take it home and eat it. Ignore the world. Ignore all the junk. I mean, you know, they've been talking for three years about the next election in 2024 between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Have you been paying attention to this for three years? That makes you foolish. That has nothing to do with God. You know, God's going to put in charge who he wants to be in charge. Think about it. And you say, well, why did he put Joe Biden in charge? 
because God has a plan that you don't understand and I don't understand. You can say the same thing about Donald Trump. Why did God allow Donald Trump to win that election? Because God has a plan that neither of us understand. We know some of the plan, but only God knows all of the plan. So when you see, you know, sexually immoral, homosexuality, slave traders, liars, perjurers. Don't, don't hang out with them. Get away from them. As Christianity, your faith in Jesus Christ, get away from those types of people. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was showing mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Okay, that's true. Paul did act in ignorance. When Paul was going around killing the Christians, and his name was Saul, S-A-U-L, before the road to Damascus seeing Jesus, he truly believed. He truly, truly believed that he was um, killing these Christians on God's behalf. You know, Paul could speak several languages. He's a Roman citizen. He's a Jewish citizen. He knows all these things. He's a very smart man. He had letters from Rome. He had uh, money given to him. He had soldiers with him. Yes. So Paul can claim ignorance because he 100% believed he was fighting on God's behalf. But then Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul proves what he's saying about his ignorance when he says, who are you, Lord? He had no idea who Jesus was. He wasn't saved. He didn't have a clue in the whole world who Jesus Christ was. The same guy he was persecuting. But he didn't know him or anything about him. So he says, who are you, Lord? And then Jesus said words that you never want to be said to you. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus um, showed his complete ultimate authority right there. He also showed that you don't have to fight on your own behalf. Jesus will show up and fight on your behalf for you. You see, because Paul, Saul, S-A-U-L, Saul could have said, I'm not persecuting you, I'm persecuting the Christians. But he didn't argue with Jesus because there was a bright light and a loud thunder. And he says, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. In other words, Jesus showed up and said, I see you're persecuting my followers. So here I am. You want to you wanna go to battle with me or do you want to um, bow down and worship me and I will use you? That's why he was doing it in ignorance. I acted in ignorance and unbelief. He, Saul was not a believer until he became Paul. Well, he was a believer in Jesus when he saw the, the bright light and um, the loud thunder, and then he was blinded and had to be led into town like a little blind you know, calf. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So um, Paul, he knows what it's like to persecute and kill people, be on the wrong side, and have Jesus say to you, you, you are forgiven, Paul. I will use you. I forgive you. Jesus said, and this is really the most important part of the story, because you're out there, you say, well, I, you don't know what kind of sins I committed, Dave. You're right, I don't know, and actually, I don't even want to know. I don't want to get into your business. I don't want your business inside of my head. You are correct about that. 
Not only do I not know, I don't want to know. That may shock you. I'm not a computer. I can't store all this useless information in my head. I'm trying to um, follow Jesus in my own life. But I'm telling you, your sins are not even 5% of what Saul used to do against Jesus and the believers. So if Jesus, see, you're using this as an excuse to not follow Jesus and not have faith in Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's what it's all about. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And you're saying, oh, he could never forgive me because um, I'm the ultimate bad boy in all of history. Blah, 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 blah. You may be more bad than me, but you're not worse than Saul used to be. No. Like you got these guys with rap music. And they get up and they want to tell every single person what a bad boy they are and how they're the toughest one in the whole world or in their own their own neighborhood. Don't mess with me. I'll gun you down. Blah, 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 blah. You're using these things as excuses. You see, even um, compare yourself to Paul. Even Paul was smart enough to set down his old life and pick up his new life in Christ. 70 or 80, 70%, 75% of the world does not claim Jesus Christ. Six billion people do not claim Christ. They are not smart enough to set down their life and pick up a new life. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul just said he was the worst of all sinners. That's what I'm saying. So I know guys out there that are like, Jesus could never forgive what I've done. <laughs> There's been people in the Bible that went around cutting people's heads off by the thousands in the Old Testament. I don't think you've ever cut off thousands of heads. But for that very reason, I was showing mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus, might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. This is to show God's patience. You know, I got I got a couple problems that I've had since I was a child. They're not big things. I'm not no, I'm not going to tell you what they are. They're minor little things. But I only bring this up. Do you know Jesus has been patient with me for 61 years? And I, I'm not bragging. I don't sin a lot. I don't do things like that. I don't go around trying to sin. But I can tell you, Jesus Christ has been patient with me for 61 years of my life, growing me, maturing me, bringing me to this point where I can, you know, study these Bible passages out loud and try to help others. Do I sit here all boastful and proud saying I'm the greatest or I'm the toughest person in the hood? No, that's foolishness. That's all stupidity. That It makes you a fool. According to the Bible, that's what it says. Go ask your mother. She'll tell you the same thing. Son, you're acting like a fool. Daughter, you're acting like a fool. Start living, stand up and live correctly. Now to the King Eternal, that's Jesus Christ, King of Kings, immortal, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, at the end of the day, Jesus has ultimate power, ultimate power, 
All authority and power has been given to him for all eternity. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what a, how good you are, and it doesn't matter how bad you are. The only thing that matters is, did you follow, believe in Jesus Christ, start following Jesus Christ, and then receive eternal life in and through Jesus Christ? Because it doesn't matter. You know, this sounds stupid, but you can go to the gym and lift weights for 50 years. You can be one of the world's strongest senior citizens, put it that way. You would not have more strength in your whole body than Jesus has in his little finger. Think about it. So what are you really living for? Now, this is what it really comes down to. The majority of people, even Christians, have fallen asleep. 70 to 80% of all Christians have fallen asleep. Because they're living for themselves. They're not, they're living to, I want to look better, so they go to the gym. I want more money, so they work more. I want a better car, so they, they get a fifty to $70,000 car loan. I want a better house. Let me tell you how stupid this generation is. I want to do some barbecuing. I want to do some barbecuing this summer. So does the person go down and buy a $30 barbecue and just go out in their front yard and barbecue some meat? No, 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 no. First thing they have to do is build a deck on the back of their house for $19,000. I'm going to build a $19,000 deck on the back of my house, and then my wife's going to buy $2,000 worth of deck patio furniture. Then I'm going to buy a $3,500 grill, a master griller. That's me, a master griller. Meat cooker. <laughs> I laugh because, you know, I worked in restaurants 25 years. If they knew, if you knew what they did to the food back there, you'd never eat out again. And I'm telling you, the guy's going to spend thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 on his backyard so he can start cooking some, you know, slabs of meat this summer. And, and I describe this generation perfectly. Three-bedroom house, $280,000 house, two bathrooms, two-car garage, $750 grill, $50,000 car payment. Does that sound like you're living for God or does it sound like you're living for the things of this world that will bring you pleasure? Well, you're living for the things of this world. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you. So that be, by recalling them, you may fight the battle well, holding on to the faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith, to the faith. See, some people shipwreck their own faith all day long. What Paul is doing, he's writing this letter to Timothy to encourage him. Timothy was a very young man. Among them are Hymius and Alexander. Now check this out. There's two guys there that were going in and completely trying to destroy everything Paul was doing. And what does Paul do here? You know, before I read this, we are being taught in the church today, Oh, you're supposed to love your enemies, love everyone, hold hands with your enemies, sing kumbaya, put a gay pride flag on the outside of the church, invite every gay person into your church, hoping that they don't destroy the church. 
You think when they walk into your church, they're going to stop being gay? They're going to stop being homosexual activity? Or do you think that maybe eventually they're going to cause half the church to start participating in the orgies also? But what? how did um, Paul respond here to these two men? How did Paul respond? Because he's just brought up homosexuality and everything here. We just went through it. How does he respond to these two men? You see, Paul had power too, like Jesus had on earth. Paul had the power given to him through Jesus Christ, just like Peter and John. Now check this out. What did Paul do? Did Paul write them a nice letter? Did Paul, now, he probably warned them several times to stop doing what they were doing. But then, what did Paul do to these two men? This is going to um, shock you, you Christians who think God is only love and God could never punish anyone. I, Paul, have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blasphemy. He has taken these two men whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blasphemy. Now, I don't even fully understand that, how Paul could hand them over to Satan or how Paul could even have. It had to be through prayer. Paul was praying for these men that God would hold the devil back because these two men were giving the devil a foothold and they were giving them a foothold giving the devil a foothold by all their homosexuality, their, their blasphemous acts, their, their, their speech, their um, lying, deceiving, stealing. So at some point, Paul must have stopped praying for them and requested that the, uh, the devil come in and teach them a severe lesson. Wow. Is that the Christianity you serve? Probably not. Now think about this. What were those men doing that modern day Christians aren't doing today? Modern day Christians watch TV. They're in debt. They're overworked. They scream and yell at their children. They drink beer. They smoke cigarettes. They look at pornography. Some of them participate in homosexuality. Modern day Christians in the church are doing exactly what these two men were doing. That Paul turned over to Satan to be taught not to blasphemy the name of God. That's the end of chapter one.